Hello students and welcome to our video lecture for this week. Um, this week we're covering chapter 11 which is synthesis problems and uh, we have been talking about synthesis a little bit in every chapter all the way up till now. So what we're going to see in this chapter isn't going to really contain anything new. Uh, in terms of content it's a rather short chapter. Uh, the purpose of this chapter is to help you to practice even more with with synthesis problems and uh, and to get an experience with some longer synthesis problems. We won't have very long synthesis problems on exam three, but as we go into the final and after we're practicing with, with longer synthesis problems in this chapter, we'll have a we'll have a, a, a several step synthesis occur uh, on the final. And so you'll want to practice these and and also just uh, you know when you're getting stuck, uh, just to send me an email you know, a quick email uh, about about which problem you're doing so I can maybe give you a hint. Uh, of course, all of the answers are in the book, uh, are in the manual and stuff, solution manual. Um, so you can look at the solution, but be careful because these are the kinds of problems where it's really easy to trick yourself into thinking, oh yeah, I can do this on my own after you've looked at the solution. But the only way you'll really know is by trying a lot of problems getting some wrong, and then getting them more and more right as you go along. Uh, these problems combine reactions from all of the chapters we've learned up till now. Uh, so this includes 7, 8, 9, 10. All of these chapters have new reactions, and we're going to use those reactions in syntheses. And as you go forward, you'll be uh, using even more reactions in your syntheses as we learn more of them and go into Chem 213. Uh, for next semester as well. Okay, so uh, the goal of today's lecture is going to be just to give you a few hints on what you should be looking out for when you're planning the steps in your synthesis. So we've talked about one-step syntheses as they relate to the various reactions in our chapter. Uh, for example, if we're taking a look at this and we're asked, well, if we're starting with, with this um, uh, alkene right here, how can we make this dihalide? And so this is just a one-step synthesis. This is a halogenation. It's a reaction that we encountered in, in chapter, uh, in, in chapter uh, 8. Okay, and so um, here all we need to do is find the one reagent we would need to make, make this happen, and it would be uh, Br2 would be the reagent, and um, we could also indicate a, a um, solvent, potentially like CCL4 is the common one to indicate here, uh, or you know, or not. Uh, the solvent isn't always specified, but certainly Br2 here uh, would add Br in an anti-fashion. Uh, that's something to keep in mind if the stereochemistry is relevant. Here, the stereochemistry isn't because we have two. Uh, we, neither of these carbons are chiral. So we've got um, you know two methyl groups attached to this car carbon, and we got two hydrogens here which aren't drawn, which are attached to this one. Uh, but if there is stereochemistry involved, you have to think about that as well. Um, and so you'll want to go through, and while you're reading this, uh, you're going to want to go through each of the conceptual checkpoints and give these a shot in the chapter as you're moving along, right? Uh, so. Make sure that you're doing that while you're reading, especially in this chapter. It's really important to get experience with as many problems as possible uh, so that you just kind of internalize the steps that are needed to do, or the, the reactions that are needed to do common steps, uh, which we will summarize as well in this lecture. So as we had discussed in, in, a, in chapter 8, if we, we have several different types of moves that we might want to do. Uh, one move is taking some type of substituent like the bromine atom here and moving it over to a neighboring carbon right here. And so we talked about this in a previous chapter where if you want to move over a, func a, a group like this, a substituent, what you do is you remove it by elimination and then you add it back on by addition uh, but in the position that you want. So for example here, uh, we have a bromine atom at the secondary position. We want to do an elimination to get uh, this double bond, this alkene, and then we want to add, uh, and, and, we, and we want to get the, uh, so the Zaitsev product here. 
So remember that when we do an elimination, we have two potential regiochemical outcomes. We could have a, the, the so-called Zaitsev product where the double bond is more substituted. We want to be careful not to put the double bond right here where I'm putting a dotted line, not here, right? So we don't want to have uh, the Hoffman product of the elimination here. We want the Zaitsev one because we're trying to get the bromine here onto this tertiary carbon. Uh, and then we'll do an addition, and when we do the addition, again, we have to be careful about the regiochemistry of our addition. What we're going to want is the Markovnikov addition of, H, uh, of HBr, or the addition where the, the bromine goes on the more substituted carbon. And so we've got, you know, various options. We have to make sure to choose the one that will get us the correct regiochemical and stereochemical outcomes here. So, for example... Uh, when it comes to the elimination, we have two options here. We can go with a non-sterically hindered base, which will get us the double bond here at the more substituted position. We want to do that as opposed to using the sterically hindered base, such as terp-butoxide, which would give us an elimination that would produce a double bond over at the less substituted position. So with the TBOK, we'd be removing this H here and this Br, and we get a double bond here, whereas with the NaOET, the sodium ethoxide, we'd end up removing the hydrogen here on this carbon and the bromine and getting a double bond at the less substituted position. Now, when we go, now all we have to do is add the bromine in the right position. So we do a hydrohalogenation here, <clears throat> and we can add the bromine at the more substituted position. The alternative would be to do the hydrohalogenation with a peroxide, with Rohr, which is just a general peroxide here. If we did that, though, we would add the bromine in the less substituted position here. So, so uh, we would go back to our initial reactant. That's what we don't want to do. And so we're ruling out this possibility. We're going to continue along this path and put the bromine here. Um, Note that if we were looking for the product where we wanted to put the bromine over on this, this carbon right on the end here, so if we were moving the bromine from here over to here, well then in that case we would need to use the sterically hindered base so we can get the double bond here at the less substituted position. Then we would do HBr Roar. Uh, this would give us the, um, the anti-Markovnikov addition and we get the bromine in the less substituted position. So uh, it's important to plan out your synthesis such that you have that, you know, you add the bromine in the correct position. Uh, and we have various options for choosing uh, the, you know, what will get us to the correct regiochemistry for putting the bromine in the right place. Uh, when it comes to Functional group transformations as they go as they as they uh, relate to hydroxide. So, hydroxide remember has this special case, a special situation where the OH by itself is a terrible leaving group, and so often we have extra steps to get rid of it to do an elimination or so forth. Uh, so this summarizes those steps here. Something seems to have. Uh, gone wrong with my slide real quick. I don't know why this is in the background. I'll bring that to the front. Um, all right. And so likewise, when we're doing the, when we're trying to get a product here, this is a similar situation to the one we had last time, but instead of moving a bromine, we're choosing to move an OH, and we can move it over to this carbon here, or we can move it over to this carbon over here, depending on our choice of reaction. So first of all, what you're going to notice in both cases is that we need to find a way to make the OH a good leaving group. And there are two ways to do this. The easy common one is to, um, to have uh, use tosyl chloride, the tosylates, with a pyridine solvent in order to replace the OH with uh, the OTOS leaving group, the tosylate, which is this large molecule that we talked about uh, but a, it's a great leaving group, stabilizes the negative charge very well. And so that's one option. The other option is we can protonate the alcohol. Uh, if we protonate the alcohol uh, by using uh, concentrated sulfuric acid, uh, in between here what we'd get is the alcohol 
that uh, now has uh, one extra hydrogen and it would have a positive formal charge then when it leaves as a leaving group it leaves as water which is you know however it leaves when it leaves as uh, when it when it, when it leaves the leaving leaving group it's going to leave as water and that will be a stable molecule rather than the uh, negatively charged hydroxide which uh, does not stabilize that negative charge great it's okay uh, but it's it's definitely not a great leaving group but like a bromide or a halide those stabilize the negative charge very well because of their combination of large size and um, and high electronegativity oxygen has the high electronegativity part but it doesn't have the large size <laughs> and so uh, it's not as good as something like a bromide ion so uh, now when when we're doing after we've replaced the group so here we've replaced the functional group with a tosylate, uh then we would do an elimination and like before we have two choices with the elimination we can use a sterically hindered uh, base such as terbutoxide or we can use a non sterically hindered base such as sodium ethoxide if we lose if we use the non sterically hindered base we're going to get the double bond in the more substituted position if we use the sterically hindered base, we're going to get the double bond, the less substituted position. Okay, uh, and then at that point, we're ready to add on, add back on our OH. So we can do this by an acid-catalyzed hydration, which will give us the Markovnikov product, where the OH group adds to the more substituted carbon, or we can do the hydroboration oxidation. However, that will put the OH at the less substituted position. We'll put the OH right here, but that will return us to our initial reactant. Uh, so we don't want to uh, do that one in this case. We're going to avoid this one. Now, uh, we can do also, a. Uh, we can use instead, do an elimination with a sterically hindered base. In that case, that will put us the double bond over here at the less substituted position. So we'll lose OH here and hydrogen here, which will put a double bond right in there. And so this would be useful if we want to put it, the OH on the end here. However, we also again have to be careful to do the correct hydration that will lead to the uh, regiochemical outcome that we're looking for. If we use acid catalyzed hydration like we did up here, or if we use a hydro, uh, oxymercuration, demercuration, we're going to get the OH at the more substituted position on this side of the double bond it will add. That is going to return us back to our initial reactant. So we don't want to do that in this case if we want to get this product here with the OH over here on the end. Instead, we'd use a hydroboration oxidation uh, and that will add the OH group in the less substituted position, which would be right here on the end, and that's what you can see in the final product here. And so these are the kinds of considerations you want to have in your mind when you're uh, deciding how to move a group one space over. Uh, <clears throat> notice here, one additional thing is hydroboration oxidation was used here, or I mean oxymercuration demercuration was used here instead of acid-catalyzed hydration because... If you'll notice, if we're hydrating right here, we're going to get a carbocation intermediate that may want to undergo a carbocation rearrangement, which would add the OH over here instead. So the value of the, ox uh, uh, the oxymercuration, demercuration, is to make sure that that doesn't happen, and that puts the OH right back here. So these are the ways in which you move a functional group. If you have a nice leaving group, it's simply you know, do an elimination, add, uh, do an addition. But if you have a terrible leaving group like hydroxide, you'll want to specifically OH or some alcohol group, uh, some, uh, some alkoxy group. There could be a you know, methyl over here and ethyl as well. If you want that to leave, you're, you're, specifically if, you, if it's OH, you'll want to use a tosyl chlorine purity um, to replace that OH with a better leaving group. Um, the other move that I've shown you before, uh, in, also in chapter eight, was a movement of a pi bond. So a movement of a pi bond it kind of goes opposite to movement of a, a substituent. For a movement of a substituent, we do an elimination to remove that substituent. Then we do an addition to add it back on in a different place. In the case of moving a pi bond, uh, a double bond here, what we want to do is do an addition 
to add ourselves a leaving group so that we can then do an elimination and create the double bond where we want. So here for the first reaction, we're going to be using, we're going to be adding the HBr, and notice we're getting the Markovnikov product, and so we can simply use HBr here, and that would work just fine. Um, and then that would add ourselves the bromine in the more substituted position. Then we want to do an elimination, and notice we have two options for the elimination. Uh, we can, if we do an elimination to get the more substituted product, that's going to put the double bond right here or right here, which are equivalent. If we do the, if we want to get the uh, the double bond over in this position right here, where it is right here, uh, we're going to want to do an elimination that will give us the less substituted product. So in this case, we're going to be a, doing an elimination with uh, with a sterically hindered base, herp butoxide would be good here. Um, so again, there's a lot of options, right? Uh, there's a lot of options that can occur here. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> we need to choose the one that's gonna get us the outcome that we want. So the one we chose in the last slide was we used HBr to add bromine in the more substituted position, and then we used terp butoxide to uh, get the pi bond and the, and the less substituted pi bond here. Uh, and note that we use terp butoxide for that. If we would have used sodium ethoxide, we would have gotten the double bond right back in the position it was before. So that would not have been helpful. Um, <clears throat> likewise, if we had done a, a hydrohalogenation here in the presence of the peroxide, we would have added the bromine in the less substituted position Therefore, we would not have been able to do an elimination to get the double bond where we wanted it to. But if we went to move on to produce a, to produce a, a product such as this one, where we have the double bond over uh, in this, this position over here, uh, this is the less substituted position. If we, if we use the uh, less sterically hindered base, the sodium ethoxide, we get the double bond right back where we started. So if we wanted the double bond down here, we would want to use the more sterically hindered base like the terp butoxide. So that's how you move a pi bond. So we've got two basic moves that we, uh, we've already talked about. One is moving a substituent over by a carbon. The other one is moving a pi bond over by a carbon. And these are going to be common moves that you're going to be doing regularly in the synthesis. Uh, also previously, in the alkyne chapter, uh, we talked about how we can interconvert between alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes. And it was only just recently when we got to the radical chapter that we finished this diagram that we have here. So we had all of the parts uh, here, but we didn't have this last part uh, where we needed a radical reaction in order to halogenate a... Um, a alkene because they're or, sorry an alkane because they're fabulously unreactive so that we could then do other reactions like eliminations or uh, and additions and so forth so that we can produce other products uh, so if we're starting with an alkene uh, what should be going through your head is there's not a whole lot I can do with this it's just an alkene I need some type of a, a leaving group so I, I need some type of a polar bond Remember, most of these reactions that are the ionic reactions, not the radical ones, but the ionic reactions, they're generally propelled by the fact that a, you know, a, a positive part of a molecule is attracted to the negative part of another molecule. And so if you have a completely nonpolar hydrocarbon like this, there's nothing to initiate this radical reaction. There's nothing to attract the, the molecules together as positive and negative parts, or nucleophile and electrophile, as we called them. So uh, for an alkene, the first step is almost always going to be to add, add a, a halogen atom. And so we'll do the radical, radical bromination, uh, which remember is just a Br2, H nu, right? Uh, that's how we'd say it. And then we do an elimination. And your choice of elimination will depend on, uh, you know, what kind of product you want to get. In this case, we're going for the more substituted product. If, if we wanted the double bond over here, we'd use tert butoxide, but we want it over here instead, so we're going to use sodium ethoxide or some other uh, non-sterically hindered base. Uh, but the take-home message here is that this radical, whenever you see an alkane like this, 
the radical uh, Brahman nation is likely to be your very first step to get everything going. Uh, so that's indicated here by this bottom part. Um, if we do a radical bromination followed by an elimination, we can get a double bond. Again, your choice of base for the elimination is going to depend on the regiochemical outcome that you're looking for, uh, whether you use a sterically hindered base or a non-sterically hindered base. If we have an alkene and we want to go back to an alkane, we simply hydrogenate with a platinum catalyzed hydrogenation with H2. <clears throat> now, if we have a double bond and we want to get a triple bond, uh, we're going to have to do a double elimination. And so what we're going to do is halogenate the double bond. So if we, has, if we have something like this here, so here the steps that are going from the alkane to the alkene was, okay, we added a bromine atom. So step one, we add a bromine atom. That puts a bromine right here. And then we do an elimination uh, with sodium ethoxide. And then uh, that, that then does the elimination and we get a double bond. Uh, for the double bond here, our first step is going to be to halogenate. And in that case, we're going to get a dihalide, a vicinal dihalide. So it's going to be, there's going to be a bromine atom here, and there's going to be a bromine atom here. And so now we can do a double elimination in order to get uh, the alkyne. And so what we use is excess, NA, uh, excess sodium amide uh, to, do, to do the elimination, and then uh, water to finally protonate because after we do the double elimination, so in step two here, the results of step two are we're going to have this uh, deprotonated alkyne. And so since we need to protonate it, uh, we get water here, and then the water will then give the proton. Uh, so maybe I can make it a little bigger here. Um, so we end the second step here with this Uh, alkyne, uh, which has a, you know, a lone pair on it, and so we need to protonate that alkyne, and so then that there will be a proton transfer from water to grab that proton, and then we're all done. That's a third step after. You have to do it separate from the sodium amide. Remember why, right? It's because you had water and sodium amide in the same flask. The sodium amide would get protonated, and then it wouldn't be able to do the elimination with the alkyne. Uh, going the other way, you got two possibilities. If you want to go from an alkyne to an alkene, you use H2 Linlar uh, if you want to have the uh, syn addition of hydrogen. Uh, so if we use H2 Linlar in this case, we'd end up with this guy right here with the hydrogens attached on the same side. And uh, if we do a, uh, if we use uh, a dissolved sodium reduction, we'd get the uh, well, the trans. Um, unfortunately, there's no there's no carbons here. Let's say we had carbons, so I'll just use this as an example. If we had carbons, we'd be adding hydrogens on the same side like this. If we had two additional carbons, uh, and if we're using the dissolved sodium reduction, we'd end up with the trans double bond. I added two more carbons accidentally there, but assuming we had two more carbons, then you know, one on each end, we'd be able to see the cis and trans. For, for, al for ethyne like this, it wouldn't really matter, right? Um, we just have two hydrogens um, attached. Uh, so, this is, so this is a whole roadmap here of how we get between alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes. And you're going to be interconverting between these as well when you want to get to certain things. Uh, for example, we often want the alkyne when we want to uh, produce a molecule with more carbon atoms. Uh, we have to get to the alkyne, and so we would follow these steps to get to the alkyne. Um, <clears throat> so as I was just alluding to there, for some transformations, you might have to, uh, you know, mess with the carbon skeleton and add carbon atoms uh, or remove carbon atoms. So when a synthesis requires the carbon skeleton to be removed, uh, you're going to have to use reactions that can add or remove carbons. So right now, we haven't learned many reactions like that, but we will as we move forward. We will learn more of those. Uh, <clears throat> for now, we've only mostly learned reactions that can change a functional group or where it's at. Um, however, we do have one reaction that can add for us carbon atoms, and that is the reaction in which we start with a deprotonated alkyne, and we have a primary alkyl halide. <clears throat> and we do a nucleophilic attack here where the alkyl halide attacks this carbon, the halogen leaves, 
and we get a longer carbon chain. Now this carbon here is attached to three more carbons. So we can see our initial alkyne had four carbons, these four right here, one, two, three, four. Our, al our, our final product here ha also has these three carbons added on the end. Um, <clears throat> so right now, if we're, for now, if we're gonna add carbon atoms to our, and have a product with more carbon atoms than we started with, this is our only option. So you should keep that in mind. Um, and then when it comes to making um, aldehydes or ketones, we've got a few different ways of doing that. One is if we have an alkyne, uh, we can do a, hydra a hydration and get a ketoenol tautomerism. And so that will give us an al al uh, you know, or aldehyde or a ketone. Uh, the alternative is we can, uh, if we have an alkene, we can use the ozonolysis. Um, now, if, if the molecule is asymmetrical like this, this will produce for us two products here. And so remember, when you're doing the ozonolysis, you just kind of chop in your mind, and then you put a double bond to oxygen on either side. So here, this carbon, it gets its double bond oxygen right there. And then this carbon here, it gets its double bond oxygen right there. And we chopped it. And we have two aldehydes. No. <clears throat> So when you're getting ready to do a synthesis problem, here's the way you want to think. Um, first, you want to see, is it, getting, is it gaining or losing carbon atoms? If it is, um, you, if it's gaining carbon atoms, then you're going to think about using a deprotonated alkyne. If it's losing carbon atoms, you're getting smaller like we had here, you're, using, you're doing the ozonolysis. So notice we started with five carbon atoms, and we produced aldehydes, and if one has four and one has one. We chopped it, right? So if you're losing carbon atoms, you're going you're gonna to want to do the ozonolysis. Um, <clears throat> is there, is it, are, are the functional groups moving around? So are there alkenes moving around, uh, you know, double carbon-carbon double bonds? Are there halogen atoms moving around? Um, look for that as well. And then you, you will choose the appropriate reactions that will achieve this change in the molecule. Uh, as I said, the lectures this week aren't going to be that long because I'll show you a few examples, but the way you really get good at this is just trying problems, uh, trying, failing sometimes, and trying until you're getting better and better at it. Uh, that's, and so most of your time related to Chapter 11 is not going to be learning anything really new. It's just going to be practicing. So uh, here, for example, is a skill builder 11.3 from your book. So uh, let's say that we want to do this transformation as shown. Uh, well, we should think about it. Is there a change in the number of carbon atoms? Uh, do we have more or less carbon atoms? And indeed, we start with one, two, three, four, five carbon atoms. And we end with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven carbon atoms. So we've added on two carbon atoms. Fortunately, we're starting with an alkyne, and so we know the first step is probably going to be to deprotonate that alkyne, right? So the first step here uh, would be the, uh, so also note, are we, are we changing functional groups, right? So that's the second step. So the first step we know we're going to be doing something with the alkyne. Uh, lastly, we're also changing functional groups. We don't end with the alkyne. We end with an alkene, and so we're going to have, a, to have another reaction that's going to uh, take the alkyne that we get uh, from doing the deprotonation. Uh, so let's just talk about that here. Let's say we do that. First, we start with, uh, we're going to deprotonate the alkyne. So we use NaNH2, okay? And you can mention the solvent or not. The solvent would generally be ammonia. Uh, and so that, what that's going to do is that's going to deprotonate the alkyne. And so that's going to get us this right here. So that's step one. Then step two is going to be, uh, we're going to uh, now add two carbon atoms. So the way we do that is we'll take like ethyl iodide or ethyl bromide, and that'll be our second reactant. And when, that, when we use that, we're going to have the nucleophilic attack here, and the leaving group will leave, and we'll end up with <clears throat> this structure here. We'll add two carbon atoms. We'll still have the double bond. And so at that point, after step two, 
uh, we'll have, I'll write it up here since this line is kind of confusing since I have blue ink. We'll have the triple bond here, and then we'll, we'll have added now two carbon atoms to it. One, two. Okay, and so notice we don't have our final product though. We need one more step. We need to take this alkyne and we need to hydrogenate it so we get an alkene. And we need to do this in the right way. Uh, so we should think about at the end, uh, the triple bond, we need to convert to the transalkene. And so when we're going from alkyne to an alkene, uh, we're going to want to use the dissolved sodium reduction uh, for this. Right? Uh, we're going to want to use the, the dissolved sodium reduction to do this. Uh, and so our first step, as we wrote here, was we used NaNH2 and the ethyl iodide, and we get this step. And lastly, because we want the anti-addition of, of the hydrogen, we're going to use this dissolved sodium reduction. And so that adds one hydrogen to one side and one hydrogen to the other. And we finally get our problem. So this is an example of a three-step synthesis problem. Um, there will be a f quite a few of these on your final exam. I'll even have one simple three-step uh, synthesis on your exam three. Uh, we'll, uh, for your final exam, we'll go up to five steps on the synthesis. Uh, so ultimately, when you write the answer, uh, this is the way you would write the answer finally, is you just list out the steps. Uh, that's all you really have to do in the synthesis. So if you can figure, uh, you know, if I just ask you to, to you know, determine the reagents, you can list them you must list them in the correct order and you must number them uh, if you list them all without this numbers of steps it's 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 like it's uh, indicating that you're just throwing it all in the same pot and letting it go that's not what's happening right you're doing each of these independently first you're deprotonating then you're taking the deprotonated alkyne then you're reacting with ethyl iodide then you're taking that product out putting it uh, you know in a first flask and then doing a dissolved sodium reduction and so these steps are listed like one two three and so on as for as many steps as you need uh, okay and so that's going to be the end of this first video here uh, the site there will be an, a second short video that will be coming up uh, that will talk about other other little hints and tips for how you can uh, approach the synthesis the biggest one being retrosynthesis, where you, instead of trying to start from the beginning and walk the path all the way to the product, what you'll do is start uh, with the product and determine what, could what you could create that product from and work backwards until you get to the, re to the initial substrate. A lot of times we do a combination of retrosynthesis and uh, synthesis forward, and sometimes we meet in the middle. So we'll talk about that in the next video.